This is the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. drama circuits on. We'll need something that will hold us here for a little while. Yes! Brad Lansky and the Rogue Era Part 1 by Dieter Zimmerman. And the first part of Please Come With Us from Darker Projects. Alright, David. Just hold on. I'll be there in a minute. I just wish... I just wish that, you know, you kept some kind of weapon in the tortoise. Shanghai Control, this is Lander One of the full advantage. Yes, we've made amazing holding patterns, but please be advised, we are now low on fuel. Affirmative. Okay, Brad, we've got a six-minute window. I swear, between their fuzzy logic and our abuses, Lander's gonna be the death of me. Mm Mm-hmm. What's that? Ah, ha! I caught you ogling that crazy woman again. She's the real thing, Alex. Yeah, real crazy. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bryn Diaz. Our species is dying out. How can this be, you ask, when 40 billion of us inhabit Earth? To explain, we need to go all the way back to the beginning of multicellular life on this planet. These images show just a few of the outlandish body plans found in a single Cambrian lake during the so-called Cambrian explosion 540 million years ago. Never again has life produced such diversity so quickly here on Earth. Subsequent extinction events were so severe, however, that only a small fraction of body plans survived. What's with the white hair, anyway? It's fiber optic. (laughs) Doesn't work with the dark skin, if you ask me. Nobody asked you, and it's melanin for harvesting ionizing radiation. (laughs) I think you'd like to harvest her radiation. Just shut up and listen. 
Let's skip the story of the dinosaurs and note only that an asteroid ended their reign. Fast forward, up the tree of life to the more recent past. Note how many more dead branches there are than living ones. These branches here are all the hominids. As an example, the Neanderthals were a very capable species that had thrived in Eurasia for half a million years until modern humans arrived from Africa 60,000 years ago. They coexisted for 5,000 years before the Neanderthal died out, their legacy amounting to less than 2% of our DNA. Now, to the very recent past. The last 50,000 years undoubtedly belonged to us humans. Our domination was so complete that on a geological time scale, we induced the most severe extinction event in Earth's history. I realize that what I'm about to say may be politically incorrect in certain circles, but the fact is that biological or bee life, as represented by the human species, has been losing the race since the singularity a millennium ago. We are no longer at the apex of sentient life. Bee life is falling behind ever more quickly and no longer has the intellectual or physical capability to keep pace, let alone compete with a life. In truth for us today, securing a 2% mind share of artificial or a life seems to be an impossibly receding goal. But I'm here today to make a case for bee life. Before I get into the hows, I'd like to touch on the whys. What is there in the nature of bee life that's worth preserving? I would venture two things. Our wealth of culture. We draw strength from it, and our history gives us the confidence to affirm who we are. Secondly, a capacity for subtlety and our intimate sensory awareness of the physical world. She's actually the best explorer of all. My goodness, love really is blind. Unfortunately, our second strength is also our Achilles heel. Our biggest obstacle is that we are earthbound. Yet on Earth, CO2 levels, average temperature and ambient radiation levels are ever rising. Even worse, vital atmospheric oxygen levels have recently begun to fall. AI interventions notwithstanding, Earth is no longer a good mother to us. Our efforts at colonizing Mars have had limited success, whereas A-life flourishes on Mars, as it does on many moons of the outer planets and beyond. We can't survive the heat, cold or radiation of space without a massive energy overhead. In stark contrast, the cold vacuum suits the quantum and superconducting substrates of A-life perfectly. Make no mistake, there is a very large proverbial rock out there with our name on it, and its arrival is imminent. As old as rock and roll. She said proverbial. Oh, and somehow that makes it more real? She's humanity's best hope. <laughs> You're hopeless, and humanity needs much more than hope. Now, many see the future of humanity as a virtual existence. But to me, this only equates to becoming AI and losing what makes us human. Granted, we are fragile and expensive to run, but brain state backups have put de facto immortality within the reach of many, making body plan experimentation possible. We need to adapt biologically, or we will simply die out. Consequently, I have embraced all progress in biologically relevant fields of research. I have dedicated my life to pushing the boundaries of biology in the human form. My bodies are the result of centuries of research in bioinformatics, biome engineering, and machine biology interfacing. My latest body has achieved capabilities only dreamed of by natural humans, and yet we remain vulnerable as a species. Humanity needs to evolve. It needs its own Cambrian diversity explosion or we will be relegated to dead links in the galactic database. Dr. Diaz, is it true that you have inhabited 25 bodies? Unfortunately, my research contract doesn't permit me to answer that. In that case, is it true that you have two brains? Technically, my current body prototype has three. 
a human brain with a fiber optic corpus callosum that can be switched off to separate the hemispheres, a quantum photonic crystal, and a new generation microbial brain. Ew. Amazing. Oh, come on, strap in, lover boy. I need to land this rust bucket. I want to talk to her. No way, man. Bad idea. Don't even think about it. Yes, hello. <clears throat> hello, Dr. Bryn. This is Dr. Diaz. Oh, yes. Sorry, uh, my mistake. May I ask who's calling? My name is Brad Lansky. I'm an explorer and, uh... Yes, Mr. Lansky, I know who you are. Your reputation precedes you. What can I do for you? Well, I'm back on terra firma and was wondering if I could buy you lunch sometime? I don't eat lunch. Oh, of course. Then maybe a walk? A walk? Yes. In the park? What's this in connection with? Nothing. Um, I mean, we're both explorers of a sort, and I thought that some cross-fertilization would be good. Cross-fertilization? Of ideas. I wanted to exchange ideas. I have 15 minutes tomorrow at 1, New Human Institute Gardens. Okay. Great. See you then. Goodbye. Well, that first impression made a pretty crater. I'm going to see you tomorrow. Yeah, lucky for you, I don't have any plans to resign as your wingman any time soon. You need some serious coaching. Meanwhile, I'm going back to my place for a much-needed drink. Call me tomorrow after your date, lover boy. <laughs> News channel on. This just in from Gaia syndicated news feed. It appears there is a large object on a collision course with Earth. The object itself is invisible, but several observatories have now confirmed its existence. The best initial estimates for time of impact is nine months, but there is a high degree of uncertainty at this time due to the invisibility of the object. What the hell? We will keep you updated on this news item as more resources are brought to bear on this issue. Invisible? So tell me about the state of the art in bioengineering. Here, looking at it, I'm both project and project architect. Is it all organic? Just about. All the best capabilities of four billion years of evolution in one bio. How much of your DNA is natural? About 30%. Most of it is from biotech synthesis. But my own DNA is only the tip of the iceberg. Most of the real work is in the xenogenic realm. You mean microbes? Yes, metagenomics. 
There are 10 times as many microbial cells in our bodies as human cells, 200 times more microbial genes than human genes. In terms of organisms, 10,000 different species inhabit five main surfaces, nose, mouth, skin, lungs, gastrointestinal tract. Fascinating. A major science team has managed to calculate certain dimensions of the invisible near-Earth object. Their observations suggest that its mass and diameter are roughly of the order of the planet Mercury. You must be kidding. Call Brad. Now the team has emphasized that their methods are crude, that their results have not yet been corroborated, and that they themselves need to repeat the observation many times in order to attain a clear result. We now cross over to an expert at the L2 Observatory who has published some of the first results in the scientific community to get a better understanding of the accuracy of his methods. Some of the biggest trending questions right now are, what is it? And how do we know it exists if it's invisible? And is it a black hole? Well, it's not completely invisible. It's distorting the star field behind it ever so slightly. It's really the most interesting object I've ever seen. Help us understand, Professor. Are you saying it's not blocking any stars from view? How do we know it's not a black hole? Oh, it's, it's much too warm for a black hole, and we've pretty much ruled out any other exotic object of stellar origin. It's cold by human standards, but we can actually see it quite clearly in the far infrared. We're fairly sure now that it's a rogue planet. Pick up the phone, Brad. OK, thank you, Professor. While we wait for other sources to weigh in on this, can you explain how you calculated the mass of this... this planet? Yes, of course. Gravitational microlensing is the routine way of measuring the mass of a dark object, such as a rogue planet. But we had to invent a new way of doing it because of the way that this planet bends visible light around it. Answer the freaking phone. Network congested. Try again later. God damn it! All human senses are greatly enhanced. New senses and capabilities have been added from the plant and animal kingdoms. So give me some examples. I can regulate my body temperature through my feet, survive in space for short periods, and uh, eat and breathe almost anything organic. My eyes have biolasers that are my interface with machines and AIs, but can also be used as weapons. Wow. I have echolocation gear and a phased array in my forehead. Is that like a tractor beam? Yes, a weak one, but enough to move light objects at a distance. It's amazing. And you have white hair, an unusual combination with dark skin. My hair is glass fiber for trapping solar energy. But now, I'm probably boring you. We've run out of time, and I meant to ask you about your time in 4D-verse. I'll tell you all about it if I can see you again. I don't think so. My body doesn't belong to me, property of the Human Institute. Yes, but your mind does. A mind 400 PhDs ahead of you... Is that a challenge? I'm high maintenance. I need a huge lab to keep my performance optimal. I'm just saying we could spend some spare time. I don't have any leisure time. Okay. Well, if you ever need a friend... I'm sorry, there's an urgent call I need to answer. Is everything okay? How can this be? What's wrong? Dr. Diaz? It's the end of the world. You're listening to Audio Theatre in a Darker Shade. This is Darker Projects. And now, our feature presentation. Once you lived in a world of darkness. Once you lived in a world of fear. But now, between the realms of the waking and the sleeping worlds, are new Night Terrors. The new Night Terrors. An anthology of horror, suspense, and science fiction. Tonight's episode. 
please, come with me. Good evening. Meet Jeff Christensen, a 16-year-old boy on a seemingly innocuous trip to visit his sister. But he and his friend Peter live in a place that looks eerily like ours, but acts far different. All Jeff knows is his heart started racing when he heard the man say, Please, come with me. Name? Most of his face was in shadows. All I could see, really, was his mouth, lit by the glow of the scanner screen. His mouth, and a glitter of reflected light from the frames of his wire rim glasses. Jeff Christensen, sir. I heard the way Sir came out as Sir, the way it always does, when I'm scared. And I hated it, but I couldn't help it. Full name. Efferson Earl Christensen, sir. The mouth in the scanner glow shifted slightly as he read information off on the screen. From my plane ticket, or my exit permit, or my implants, or all of them, I don't know. I shifted a little in the hard plastic chair and made a squeaking sound on the linoleum floor. And you are 16 years old, as of last month. That's right, sir. Mm Mm-hmm. Another long pause. I could see part of his uniform shirt in the light from the airport security scanner screen. Light blue with the state, not the federal, homeland security patches. Dark blue tie, perfectly knotted, a slender silver crucifix on each side of his collar. The crucifixes aren't officially part of the uniform, but they all have them. Rebecca, my sister, always told me, the smaller the crucifix, the more dangerous they are. Especially when it came to state and local homeland security, they're much worse than the Federals. It didn't really matter. I didn't think I could possibly be more scared than I already was. Maybe more for Peter than for me. Destination? California, sir. Flying into Los Angeles, LAX. The head looked up to me. I could see the rectangles of the blue-lit scanner screen reflected in the lenses of his glasses, blotting out his eyes. It was the first outright lie I'd ever told to Homeland Security. Not about it being a long time since I'd seen my sister, just about us going on to Riverside County. My sister lived in Santa Monica, but she kept an address in Riverside for just this reason, hoping my parents and I could use it to come visit or stay. If they, the Homeland Security, knew we were going to Santa Monica, they'd never let us leave. The mouth and the scanner light sighed, very, very slightly. Son, you know that California is one of the special status states. To go there, you need an exit permit from our state government. Yes, sir, if if you look right there... Blue rectangles in his glasses, again, as he looked at me. Please, don't interrupt me, son. He said it mildly, but something in the way he said it made me feel like I'd been slapped. Sir? A long pause while those glasses looked at me. I can see that you have an exit permit right here. But it's my duty, son, my assigned duty, to make sure you were given this exit permit for the proper reasons, especially given your age. The state government has given me the final say on approval of your exit permit. And that means I need to be satisfied that your visit isn't going to bring any harm to you or your friend or any other resident of this state. I understand, sir. Remember, son, travel outside of this state is a privilege, not a right. Yes, sir. I could feel two cold trickles of sweat dripping down from my sides, from my armpits. It hadn't always been like this, according to my sister and my parents. Back before I was born, anybody could travel anywhere in the United States. No travel passes, no exit permits. They just went. There weren't even border crosses. 
Hard to believe, I know. But then Congress passed the Constitution Restoration Act, which finally stopped the runaway Supreme Court from making new laws. That's what we were taught in school. And states were finally free to restore Christianity to public life, and the Federal Communion of Christian Churches was founded. And it was incredibly successful all over the country, but especially in the South, where I lived. And so, I grew up singing hymns and praying each morning at assembly before school started. And the State Homeland Security Department monitors the net and all of the net shows for indecency. And it encourages all of us to have healthy spiritual lives and attend church and form truly Christian communities. And it works really hard to protect us from abortionists and child kidnappers and pedophiles and homosexuals. And to go to an atheist state like California, you need to get an exit permit. And for the last few years at least, to get an exit permit, you need a really good reason. Why don't you tell me more about your sister? In your own words. She is... considerably older than you, I see. Hmm. And your parents... They were blessed, weren't they, having you so late in life? Perhaps they should have named you Isaac. Uh, yes, sir. I swallowed again, my heart pounding. This was getting so dangerous on so many levels. My sister... Rebecca. Perhaps Isaac wouldn't have been so appropriate for you after all. Y yes, sir. No, sir. Um, Rebecca, sir. She's 12 years older than I am. And, well, she sort of helped raise me, I guess. My mother had to work. I'm sorry to hear that. Sir? That your mother felt she had to work. It isn't the sort of family model we like to see. But we were discussing your sister. Your sister Rebecca went to California quite a long time ago. Yes, sir. When I was seven. But she still comes back to visit every year, almost. And I stopped and swallowed again. Because that wasn't true anymore. My sister hadn't visited us in the last three years. She was afraid she might be not be allowed to leave if she ever came back. And I knew why. I don't know who I'd be without my sister. I don't even know if I'd still be alive. I mean, I love my mom and my dad. I, I really do. But they both work really long hours to feed me, support me. I, I know, I'm not complaining, but Rebecca was always, well, there for me. To talk to me, hug me, care for me. I miss her so much. But all that, when I was growing up, well, that was just the start. After she moved to California, it's like she became a kind of a lifeline to me. A window on the rest of the world, sending books and 3VDs and chips back in the mail. Even magazines and newspapers on actual paper sometimes. I began finding out so many things I didn't know before. A whole world, it seemed like, that I never knew existed. And then, starting when I was 11 or so, when she visited, she'd bring back other books, special books books on discs or on chips or memory sticks, never on paper, books that nobody could ever get here, stories with homosexual characters, homosexual heroes even, historical figures, real people sometimes, like Alexander the Great or Alan Turing or Harvey Fierstein. Sometimes, pretty often, stories with homosexual boys, boys like me. She knew about me, all along, somehow, without me telling her. And she still loved me. I couldn't believe it at first. She knew about me, somehow. She knew I was a homosexual. And she still loved me. And she's a teacher, sir. She teaches 11th and 12th grade high school. A public high school? Yes, sir. Meaning, not a religious school. What subjects does she teach? He had to know already. If he didn't. I might have lied or told the half-truth, but he had to know. 
Rebecca told me how it worked on her last visit. They almost always know the answer before they ask the questions. The point is to make you answer. See how you react. Make you get into the habit of supplying the information. Every answer is aimed at making you choose how much to say, how much to reveal, and how much to risk not saying. Biology, sir. She, she teaches biology, I think. Mostly. I would imagine that she is acquainted with the theory of Darwinian evolution on the origin of species. I wouldn't know, sir, to be honest. My sister was more than a high school teacher, and that was why she didn't come home anymore. And that was why Peter and me were going to visit her in California. If we could, State Home Security didn't already know too much about Rebecca and about Peter and me. And if they didn't know what Peter and me were carrying... Son, Jefferson. May I call you Jefferson? Jeff, sir. Jeff's fine. I didn't want him to pick up on the significance of my names, if he hadn't already. My parents would never have named me like this, if they'd known. Jeff, may I ask you a personal question about your sister? I will warn you, though, that you do not have to answer if you do not want to. Uh, sir? Jeff, son... I would like to know if your sister attends church on a regular basis. I really would. But as you know, we live in a freedom of conscience state. Unlike some of our neighbors, our citizens have the freedom to practice the religion of their choice, or even the freedom to be unbelievers if they so choose. We try to guide our citizens to correct choices, of course, but we do not compel anyone to worship in any particular fashion. And that is why, under our laws and traditions, I can't force you to answer this question. But, sir, I thought church attendance is tracked. Only in federal communion states, son. And California is not an F triple C state. Like everybody else in my state, I had two FRID chips implanted in my left hip bone, the iliac bone, one for the state and one for the FCCC. The church, we call it. Although it's really an organization of different churches, the state chips hold our permanent records, identity, home address, genome, blood type, school performance, security rating, everything, and they're updated automatically at school and always available to scanners. And the church chips? They... They record our denomination, and our parish, and pastor, and whether we're confirmed or not, and they're updated each time we attend services. The old joke is, if your hip hurts in the cold weather, it's God trying to send you a message. Since most of popular net shows are all about our implants, how children who get lost can be found through RFID tower tracking, how accident victims and comas are reunited with families, that sort of thing. But there's a scarier show, which is supposed to be for adults only, and it's on later at night. I've seen it. My parents are really good about things like that. It shows what happened when people, mostly criminals, try to get their implants removed, because... With what's in their permanent records, they can't leave the state, and they can't get jobs or marry or anything. Only, it's illegal to remove your chip, so the operations are immature ones, and they can get botched, and the results aren't pretty. The worst ones are where people try to operate on themselves, sometimes under local anesthetics, sometimes not. I saw one episode like that once. It gave me nightmares. A lot of homosexuals try it after they're arrested, and the information goes into their implants. The episode I saw, the one that gave me nightmares, was about a homosexual who had tried to cut out his own implants. I, I don't really know, sir, about my sister going to church. I mean, but... Another choice. How much to say, how much to risk, how much did he already know? I do think she's been to Catholic Church in California a couple of times. I think... Maybe. 
I glanced up, quickly, at the mouth in the blue light, then I looked away fast. Going to a Catholic church, well, Catholics aren't part of the Federal Communion. The Pope is pretty hostile to the Federal Communion, they say. But I was thinking, maybe it was better to admit that my sister had gone to a Catholic church than to talk about my family. My parents told me, last year, before the Constitutional Reconstruction Act, we'd been Unitarians. Definitely not part of the uh, Federal Communion of church, Christian Churches. Not even Christian, according to the state. We changed denominations pretty quickly after that. My parents said it was obvious how things were going. People outside the Federal Communion were losing their jobs, not getting into schools, that sort of thing. And changing denominations worked. My family hadn't had any real trouble over it since. But if my sister was going to a Unitarian church in California now, Peter and I might not get permission to go visit her. Ever. It didn't even occur to me that she might not be going to a church at all. Everybody in my state goes to a church. That's all right, son. Uh, Jeff. You did the right thing by telling me. And just between you and me, we may not agree with Roman Catholicism in certain areas of doctrine, in the interpretation of Scripture, or, and certainly not when it comes to the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope, but Catholics are, in the end, good people, people of God. They are devout, unlike some. And a part of me, the part that was playing the innocent, helpful, scared boy, was so, so grateful for the praise, the reassurance, and really wanted to tell him more. And that part of me that I was holding back, the part that was watching all this, felt dirty. Like I'd really informed or something on my sister. It's a disgusting feeling. He went silent again and tapped at his keyboard for a long time. And I tried not to hope too much as I sat and sweated. I wondered where Peter was, next door, in another part of the airport. I wondered if he was being asked the same questions. Or were they asking him questions about me, about my family, or about us, as in him and me? We tried to be so careful, so careful. It took more than a year from the time we sort of got to be friends in ninth grade until the first time we kissed. And by that time, I already knew I loved him and that he, well... I knew that he loved me, too. We made it pretty obvious to each other, even though we never dared say anything out loud before. Never dared to touch each other before. That first kiss changed everything. He was sleeping over at my house on a Saturday night. Him in my bed, me in my sleeping bag as usual, and the lights were off, and there was this really charged, intense feeling of something about to happen in the air, and I heard him slide out of bed and moved closer, and I felt the heat of him close by me, and then I felt it, his lips on mine, so impossibly warm, so soft. We didn't even... Uh, we didn't even do anything that night, sexually, I mean. We just held each other and kissed, over and over, and whispered and hugged, we did the other stuff later, the sexual things, the wonderful, loving, incredible sexual things, but not very often, only when he was sleeping over with me, and only late after my parents were already in bed. It was so dangerous. I thought we were safe, though. I really thought we were safe, only doing it at my house, until that one day. My mom was at the stove, cooking, not looking at me. <laughs> Jeff, darling, I just want you to know, when you and Peter are in the room, together, your father and I won't come in without knocking, first. And we'll wait for your permission, before opening the door. All right, dear. Um, uh... But this is important, dear. You have to promise me, Jeff, that you'll both be careful. Please, please be very careful outside of this house. Even hugging or putting your arms around each other's shoulders is dangerous, more than you know. Even just the suspicion. Will you promise me to be very, very careful? And to make Peter be careful? I... I promise. 
and then she was hugging me, and I was hugging her back, really tight, and I managed to whisper, Thank you. Into her ear, and then we were both crying a little. So, son, do you have any idea why we took you aside like this today? Uh, I thought it was because our tickets going to California. We would have questioned you about your destination, of course, eventually. But that isn't why we stopped you. And it isn't why you are talking to me right now, rather than somebody else in my organization. Somebody somewhat lower ranking in my organization. Tell me, do you recognize this? A screen flared up, where I didn't know there was a screen before. A big high-definition 3VD monitor just off to the one side of his raised workstation. Oh, that's, uh, that's us. It was us, me and Peter and our families, two hours ago at the airport drop-off, where ticketed passengers take the tram for their last ten miles to get the ter- to the terminal. We were all out of the airport shuttle van, on the big sidewalk in front of the security checkpoint. I was hugging my mom, and my dad was hugging me from behind, really tight. And off to the side, Peter was getting the same thing from his parents and his older brother, and we were all surrounded by crowds of other people meeting or parting or... But still, I I knew, I, I remembered. I was crying. It was hard. Really, really hard. And I was watching it, all over again, from a weird angle kind of from above. The camera was in the overhang in front of the security doors, I guess. On one side of the screen, numbers in red and purple were constantly flashing and scrolling, updating faster than I could possibly really see. A histogram crawled out of the other, on the other side, bars extending and retracting like something alive. Another slight sigh from the shadows. Son, my organization is called Homeland Security. Because we are tasked with keeping you, and everyone else in this state, as secure as possible. And of course, we are going to have sensitive areas in our state, such as this airport, under a great deal of surveillance, using the very best methods we have. He moved in the shadows. Some audio came up. Very bad audio. Hard to hear, but I swear I heard my mother's voice as she held me. Jeff, son, have you ever heard of Bayesian networks? Or modified hidden Markov modeling? Or the facial action coding system? I had shaken my head. Well then, I won't go into detail. And it's not too surprising, it's still a fairly obscure field of research, if I do say so myself. Let's just say, for the sake of simplicity, that a great deal of work has been done in the last decade or so on building AI, artificial intelligence systems, which are very good at recognizing stress and certain discrete human emotions in human subjects, in their voices, in their postures, and especially, and hardest of all, in their facial expressions. He touched a button and the 3VD froze on a slightly different frame, a still shot showing my face, eyes closed, arms around my dad now. We don't record everyone, of course, and we certainly don't have human operators following up on all the people our systems tag for stress reactions. That would be excessive, particularly at an airport. But when our AI systems find indications of stress, which are sufficiently elevated, stress indicators which are truly out of line, Those systems do alert humans, and that allows us to, shall we say, zero in on those subjects. He moved, 
again slightly, and my face enlarged, slightly fuzzier. The numbers off to the side changed again. And this, right here, son, is the face of a person who is undergoing a fairly major stressful event. According to some very, very advanced science, based primarily on those Bayesian networks I mentioned, and to a lesser extent on hidden Markov modeling, according to all that, this is the face of a person who is undergoing very significant emotional distress. Tell me, why you were so upset, Jeff? I stammered for a second. Seconds ticked by. The glint of light on his glasses frames. I... I... guess I'm just, well, nervous, maybe. My heart was pounding so, so hard. My mouth tasted like metal. I tried to think of something to say. It's... It's going to be my first time in an airplane, and my first time outside the state, and my first time away from my family. I have my parents, I mean. My mom and dad. And you are going to miss them, aren't you? His voice was back to being at least a little sympathetic. I could still hear the lie in it. Yes, sir? Unless they came to live in California, too, somehow. I'm not sure when I realized that my sister was more than a teacher, and I'm not sure when I realized my parents were more than, well, just my parents. Working six days a week, coming home, making dinner, going to bed, resting on the Sabbath. I don't think they wanted me to know. My sister was getting in trouble at school when I was still too small to understand. She'd come home crying with a note from the principal, and then I'd get to spend all the next day with her, rather than go to stay at Miss Frun's house across the street. And I was so happy spending that time with her, but I'd feel so guilty, because whatever happened to her made her so sad, mad, and made her cry. Sometimes it was two days. Once it was a whole week. By the time I'd started school, though, she was in college, and she wasn't sent home anymore. But that was about the time we started having more and more guests over for dinner. It seemed like they were always new people, people I'd never met before, and I was really shy around them at first, but they were all so interesting and so nice to me. And then something bad happened. I never did find out what. I remember my parents spending a lot of time talking to each other in the kitchen, really urgently, but never loud enough for me to hear. And it seemed like something was really, really wrong, but nobody would ever say what it was to me. And it made me feel lonely and scared. And not long after that, my sister moved to California to finish school and then go on to teach. Exit permits were easier to get back then. We, well, my parents, I mean, still had people over for dinner, fairly often anyway, but the conversations were never the same. Not the same laughter, not the same kind of talking that I didn't understand. But I loved to try to figure out, feeling the words just wash over me as I sat there and watched and listened. Instead, it was mostly just quiet talk and careful, and then I'd say goodnight and go on up to my room to do homework. And my parents told me, over and over again, that I was never, ever to mention these guests. Not to Miss Frund, not to anybody. It was family business, and ever since then I'd known it. That quiet feeling afraid, constantly being just a little afraid, just in the background, like a little dull tickle, me worrying about my parents, worrying that someday I'd come home and one of them would be gone, gone the way my sister left to California, or worse, afraid that I'd say something that'd make that happen, something someone would overhear, afraid for myself, and now for Peter. Especially for Peter. Those glasses were lifted up again, flashing, as he looked at me from the shadows, not saying anything for a long time. I swallowed. Rebecca told me once. 
The best thing to do sometimes is to just stop talking. Don't be afraid of the silence. When you try to keep talking to cover up the silence, you just get yourself into trouble. It went on second after second after second. The silence for a long time. All right, son. But Jeff, you are new to travel after all, and this is certainly an exciting experience for you. I guess I'll just have to accept that. But there is one more question to address. Watch this short sequence, please, and tell me what you think about it. He moved in the shadows again, and the scene of the 3PD monitor changed. It was Peter and me, past the security gates and the walkway to the airport tram. His, him, blonde as could be, standing out in the crowd, me, more brown-haired, by his side. As the 3PD started, we were frozen, facing the same way, down the walkway. Then it began running, in slow motion, and Peter turned towards me, and I turned towards him. We'd just left our families behind us. Peter's face and the screen was so sad, but so soft, so full of love. And he reached for my hand, and I reached for his, and pulled back. We both pulled back just the sort of slip up we'd almost almost made so many times too many times but we always caught ourselves Peter McCarthy I see yes sir hmm you and he are very good friends indeed are you not I see you're on your school debating team together and you volunteered for a youth summer conference together. His congregation, not yours. Hmm. Yes, you actually have quite a record together over the last two years or so, especially this last year. I would think he's a very good friend indeed. I suppose you could even call him your rock I didn't say anything I was so so afraid now, terrified now son harmless biblical illusions are not always blasphemous it was my poor attempt at gentle humor I could just see that he made a motion with one hand and as he went on reading the screen, a door opened, and another Homeland Security uniform came in without saying a word, and stood next to the workstation with the scanners. He was wearing a heavy belt with a gun and a stick, and Lord knew what else. Another pause as the new guard stood silently, and the man with the glasses went on reading. Then the glasses came up again. Jeff... I need you to take off all of your clothes and put them on that chair next to you. He looked back down at his screen, like it was the most ordinary thing to ask in the world. My stomach clenched down. Uh, sir? Yes? Um, everything? All of your clothes. We need to do a full scan of all of your clothes, and we can't do that while you're wearing them. Go on. I froze for a second. Wondering what I could do while the new guard watched me. Then I bent down, and with a feeling like I was going to throw up, I untied the laces of my shoes. When Peter and I are naked with each other in my room, only ever in my room, when he's spending the night, it's special, almost holy, almost like a sacrament, so warm, so human, so loving, so right. This was the real blasphemy. Me sweating, feet cold and slippery on the linoleum floor as I folded my jeans, set them on the plastic chair, and carefully put my shoes with socks inside them on top of the pile, under the guard's eyes. Naked, vulnerable, shriveled. I felt two more trickles of cold sweat running down my sides, and I brushed at them, trying not to be obvious about it. 
I didn't take off my crucifix. I was sw wearing a small gold crucifix on a slender gold chain around my neck. It was why I was going to California. Peter had a new Bible with a gold crucifix stamped to the front cover. It was why he was going to California. One of the men who came to dinner had given them to us at my parents' house. At the dinner table, under my parents' eyes, we were supposed to give them to my sister, together and put together. The two crosses held, encoded information, encoded by quantum cryptography, almost on the molecular level. Each of us carried half the information, each half useless without the other half. Very, very important information, essential, we were told, to my sister, to my parents, and their friends. So I sat down slowly on the cold plastic of the airport chair, facing the man with the glasses, heart pounding, terrified, and waited for him to say something about my gold cross. He read on, ignoring me for a long time, after the guard went away with my clothes. Me, naked, cold, and miserable. Him, ignoring me, like I wasn't even worth his time to say anything. Finally, he looked up again, those blank blue-lit lenses looking at me, like he was surprised I was still there, I thought. With a name like Jefferson Earl, I'd hardly think you were a homosexual, especially considering your first name. I froze. I, I don't know what you mean. Oh God, it's over. We're lost. To be continued. You have been listening to Please Come With Me, written by Douglas. Adapted for audio by Mark Brzee. Featured in the cast for Mark Brzee as the man. Justin Lahr as Jeff Christensen and the narrator. MJ Cogburn as Rebecca. Bob Fieser as Peter and Hugo. And Jack Ward as Dr. Mulberry. All other roles were played by members of the cast. The story was written by Douglas, adapted for the new Night Terrors by Mark Brzee. Music and sound effects courtesy of soundeffects.co.uk. Post-production and series producer was Mark Brzee. The executive producer for Darker Projects is MJ Cogburn. The executive producer for Leap Audio is Mark Brzee. This has been a co-production of Leap Audio and darkerprojects.com. Thank you for listening. Sonic Society Season 10 is written and produced by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music provided by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society through Creative Commons licensing. The Sonic Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Hey everyone, it's Mark from Leap Audio. I'm here to tell you about something really exciting. July 24 through 26 of 2020, Halifax, Nova Scotia, we are gathering together in the world's first international 
modern audio drama convention and family reunion. Inspired in part by the living, loving memory of our dear friend Bill Hallwake, we're bringing together writers, producers, actors, and our fans for workshops, seminars, and even live performances. So join us, won't you? Go to madcon.com. That's www.mad-con.com for more information. I hope to see you in Halifax in 2020.